Well, anytime you want to start. Okay. Well, O heavenly King, Comforter and Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere and fill us all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us, cleanse us from every impurity, to save our souls of good ones. Glory to the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, I'd like to just welcome, uh, of course, our speaker, Doug, tonight. I want to thank you, Doug, for your courage and willingness to step up and do the first of the lectures in this rather strange uh, format of a little bit virtual and a little bit in person here. At least. Once we get it's Diana. Let me see if I can use her. Diana. Okay. That helps. Um, once again, Doug has uh, been very creative in selecting, I, I think, a story, a topic, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the presentation tonight about somebody that we don't hear about very often from the Old Testament, Joab. So without any further delay, Doug, thank you. Take it away. Okay. Well, your time is really valuable. My goal is to get through this in half an hour. We'll see how close I get to that. His story is not over yet. This is actually the third Lenten lecture that I've done in, three, in almost three consecutive years. And when I look back on it, I see it as being... Uh, the third in a trilogy of the lost stories. And for a story to be lost, it has to be historically true. And it has to be really meaningful, like our lives would not be the same, or perhaps our lives would be significantly changed if we, because of the story, and it has to be lost as in something that nobody in modern times talks about anymore. So part one was the greatest story never told, which took place right as the Western Roman Empire was collapsing and by 477, it was completely gone. And it's the story of St. Patrick. And if you've never heard that story, you'd, you wouldn't know that he was a teenager captured into slavery, taken away from his home, made a slave in Ireland, human trafficking, and that with one great unasked for, undeserved act of forgiveness, he managed to convert Ireland to Christianity and arguably save Western civilization. But you had to be there. Part two was the least understood miracle in the New Testament, which comes from Acts 9.34, where Peter heals a guy named Aeneas. Now, in the modern world, nobody knows who Aeneas is, so they don't know what this, uh, what this miracle meant. But Aeneas was the legendary hero from the Shakespeare of the Roman Empire, Virgil. He was the hero of Virgil's great epic poem. And so he represents everything that Rome represents. And yet here's this guy. He's living in Judea. He's probably Jewish. He's probably a traitor. And because, because he's got the Roman name, and yet Peter walks up to him and says, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. It's an example, an early example of how God's love in Christ is more powerful than the most powerful strength of human man represented by the Roman Empire and about how God's mercy is greater than the power, the law, and the human justice of the Roman Empire. And at that time, everybody understood this story. It says, all who lived in Lydia and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord, because they knew what this meant. And this was at 31 AD, like just a couple of years after Christ uh, was crucified in Jerusalem, and Christianity was just a zit on the face of the 
Roman Empire. And yet at that point, everybody understood that something new and greater than Rome had occurred, at least the people nearby. Well, that was part two. So part three is entitled, His Story is Not Over Yet. And it takes place in the time of 1000 BC. So ask yourself, who do you know by name from 1000 BC or earlier? What names do you know? And do you know anybody from that period of time who was not some kind of ruler or emperor or pharaoh or something from that period of time? We're going to be learning profiling somebody from that period of time where you'll not only know his name, but I think you're going to get a real sense of what kind of person this was. We're talking 1000 BC. We're talking halfway between the completely legendary Trojan War and Homer writing it down for the first time. We're talking about within 100 years of when the first alphabet ever gets created. And you're going to have a sense for the personality and the character of somebody who's not a king from that period. Well, so this is a person who uh, probably, if, I, if you thought about it, the person you know the best historical person from that period is King David. And this person, uh, we run into this person after David has killed Goliath and after he's been a rock star. But now he's on the run from King Saul. So here's the uh, cave of Adullam. This is an actual place you can go to. This is where 3,000 years ago, David fled. And you probably don't realize this, and, but it was basically around 15 years from when David was anointed king by Samuel until he actually became king. So here's the... Uh, Here's what happened when David got to this cave. So David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's household heard about it, they went down there to him. Then everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was contented gathered to him. And David became captain over them. There were about 400 men. So what kind of people were there with David? when he was on the run at the beginning with nothing, people in trouble, people in debt and malcontents. Well, I'm gonna skip this slide. So now we fast forward a few years and we get to the time following the death of King Saul. He dies in a battle with the Philistines. And so uh, on, there is a war of succession to see who's going to take over Israel after King Saul dies. Here's how it's written up in the Bible. Now, there was a long war between the house of Saul, his successor, and the house of David. And David became steadily stronger while the house of Saul became steadily weaker. So now we meet, for the first time, the person that we're going to profile and the person we're going to spend most of the evening talking about. His name is Joab. So he's one of these guys who was with David from the beginning, with the people who were in trouble, in debt, and discontented. Oh, do you want to see David's icon? I mean, sorry, do you want to see Joab's icon? David and most of the other famous people in the Bible have icons. Well, here's Joab's icon. He doesn't really get an icon. What other people in the Bible don't get icons? Well, here's a few. Do you see a pattern? What kind of people don't get icons? Well, so you, that's your first clue as to what kind of person Joab was. And uh, if you go Googling for uh, artwork about Joab, you don't get much. And this was really the best, uh, best piece of artwork I could find. And here's the first place in the Bible where he's mentioned by name. It's during the Civil War to see who, takes, who becomes king in place of Saul. Now, Abner, the son of Nair, went from Mahanaim 
to Gibeon with the servants of Ishbosheth, son of Saul. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and the servants of David went out and met them by the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down. This is going to be a battle. Ab Abner's men on one side of the pool and Joab's men on the other side of the pool. Back then, when you were having a battle, you could actually see people face to face and look them eye to eye. Current battles are really just completely different, aren't they? And here's how the battle went. That day, the battle was very severe. And Abner were defeated by the servants of David. Now, the three sons of Zeruiah were there, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. So we learn that Joab has two brothers. And Asahel was, a, was as swift-footed as one of the gazelles that is in the field. Asahel pursued Abner and did not turn to the right or to the left from following Abner. So it's, there's this battle happening, and it's almost like you get to pick who you want to fight with. That's pretty different from the way battles happen now, particularly with all these high-tech drones and people getting killed from remote control from in the Middle East, from Arizona. This is different. This is personal. Then Abner looked behind himself and said, is that you, Asahel? And he said, it is I. So Abner, Abner said to him, turn aside for your own good to your right or to your left and take hold of one of the young men for yourself and take for yourself his equipment. But Asahel was unwilling to turn aside to follow him. Then Abner repeated again to Asahel, Turn aside for your own good from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? Okay, just another little thing here about battles. Back then, the generals actually had to get out there and fight. It's really different now, isn't it? Then Abner repeated, why should I strike you to the, to the ground? How then could I show my face to your brother Joab? But he refused to turn aside. So Abner struck him in the belly with the butt end of the spear so that the spear came out of his back. And then he fell there and died on the spot. So Abner's not really trying to kill this guy. He's pushing him off with the butt end of the spear. If he wanted to kill him, he'd be using the pointy end, right? Anyway. So here we are. Now let's look at how Joab fits into David's family tree. There's Jesse. We sing about him in the uh, Christmas carols. There's David. David has a sister named Zeruiah. And uh, Zeruiah has three sons. Joab is one. Asahel's the other. And Asahel was killed by Abner. So somebody needs to turn new to the microphone. Anyway, then David does something unexpected, at least by uh, Joab. D David does a deal with Abner. He tells Abner, I'm going to make you the general if you switch to my side and we unify the country together so I can be king. And when Joab found that out, look at this down at the bottom. When Joab found about this deal, he went to the king and said, what have you done? This is the guy who killed my brother. So what do you think Joab does about that? When Joab left David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner and they brought him back. But David did not know about it. So when Abner returned, Joab took him aside in the middle of the day to speak with him privately. And there he struck him in the belly so that he died on account of the blood of his brother Asahel. So Asahel killed his brother in the middle of a battle. It was a fair fight. He really wasn't even trying to kill him. And what did Joab do? Was that a fair fight? Takes him aside without warning strikes him in the belly and kills him. Well, he's a murderer. So what happens next? Well, David becomes king and Joab remains the, uh, the general. And he has great success. He has this big battle, another big battle. He wins. There he is. He gets away with murder. 
but his story is not over yet. The next big place besides winning some battles that uh, Joab shows up is he's got a, a little part to play in the story of David and Bathsheba. This is one story everybody knows about David, and they probably remember this part, but think about how Joab fits into this. David gets Bathsheba pregnant. He tries to get Uriah, her husband, to uh, come home and sleep with her so that he'll think that the uh, kid is his own, doesn't suspect anything, but Uriah is too righteous and he refuses to go home and sleep with her because it wouldn't be fair to the other people in the battle. So in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. He had written in the letter the following, station Uriah on the front line of the fiercest battle and pull back from him so that he may be struck and filled. Now, I'm sure you've heard this story a million times before, but have you reflected on the fact that not only did David get Uriah killed, but he made Uriah carry his hit contract, his death sentence with him? So it was, Joab kept watch on the city, and he did what he was sold. He stationed Uriah at the place where he knew there were valiant men. The men of the city went out and fought against Joab, and some of the people among David's servants fell, and Uriah the Hittite also died. So here's another case where Joab is a murderer. But nothing really changes for him. He just goes from victory to victory. Now, you probably don't rem you may remember this, but he started out down south here in the cave of Adullam with just him and a few people. Then they took over this purple area, which was Israel. And this guy, who's a double murderer, is successful in battle, more than doubles the size of the country. But his story is not over yet. What happens next? Well, next we come to what happens with the more of David's family, David's own children. You notice that these children are from different wives. And uh, one of the things that the prophet Nathan told David after the case of Bathsheba was that, uh, and because of him killing Uriah, was that the sword will never leave your house. You're going to have family troubles, not just family troubles, but fatal family troubles, because you have despised me and have taken your the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. So if you read the you read the book of uh, Samuel or Third King, Second Kingdoms, as it's called in the Orthodox Bible, you'll see that uh, David had a beautiful daughter named Tamar, and she was raped by her half brother. And then her brother, full brother, Absalom, got revenge by killing this brother, Am Amnon, who, uh, who raped her. Did I say that right? Amnon raped Tamar. Absalom got revenge, killed Amnon, and then he had to leave town because he he'd committed murder. Oops. By the way, do you want to see Absalom's icon? There it is. Same as those other, same category as those other things. Now, here's the photos that came up in Google when I looked for Am uh, Absalom in the, uh, when I Googled up images for him. And it sort of fits, doesn't it? Now, in all Israel, there was no one as handsome as Absalom, so highly praised from the sole of his foot to the top of his head, there was no impairment with him. And he had fabulously beautiful hair. Look at this over there. Beautiful hair. So uh, anyway, it's interesting. It's uh, He only shows up doing things in like two or three pages. But it's like an Ag Agatha Christie uh, short story where with just a minimum amount of text, 
you can really get the feel for the character of somebody. And in this case, you get the, the, the feel for this guy, Absalom. He's vain. He's selfish. He's privileged. He's really what you'd call literally a royal jerk. Well, anyway, he's on the run. And the next thing Joab does is he tries to reconcile David to Absalom. Absalom comes back to Jerusalem. It's there's a little bit of uh, family drama that happens then. I'm going to move along fast here. But the next thing you know, Absalom has uh, triggered a rebellion. And he's got the people of Israel with him over King David. And David has to run for his life. The hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. So David said to his servant in Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for otherwise none of us will escape. So that's kind of an example of the sword never leaving David's family. So David runs. He marshals his forces with him. There's about to be a big battle to find out who's going to be king. Another one of these sort of wars of succession things. Now, we've recently had some real problems with our politics, and our politics are, may, are far from ideal, but when you compare it to the way things used to work, where the tanks would roll through the streets and you'd have wars to decide who gets to be um, the equivalent of president, uh, maybe our system's not so bad. But anyway, before the battle, David gets the generals and in front of everybody says, Deal gently with my son, Absalom, for my sake. Don't let anything bad happen to him. So here's what happens in the battle. Now, Absalom encountered the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule. This is in the battle. The mule went under the branches of a massive oak. Then his head, with all that beautiful hair, caught firmly in the oak, and he was left hanging between sky and earth while the mule kept going. When somebody saw that, he informed Joab and said, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. So what does Absalom do? Sorry, what does Joab do? Then Joab said, I will not waste any time with you here. And he took three spears in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was still alive up in the tree. So... This is like the third time he's committed murder, like against orders or contrary to David's will. And I guess you probably know the story from here. At that point, the war was over because Absalom was dead. But when the king heard about it, he wept and went up to his chamber. As he walked, he said, Absalom, my son, my son. If only I had died instead of you, Absalom, my son, my son. Well, that kind of love of a father for his son kind of brings to mind the way our Heavenly Father feels about us, doesn't it? But that's a tangent. Back to the story. Anyway, the news got out that the king was weeping, and everybody had to sneak back. They ended up sneaking back, even though it was a day of victory. They snuck back as if they would just had run away in battle. Meanwhile, the king is covering his face and crying, my son, my son. This is probably the most famous thing that Joab did. Have you heard this part of the story before? Do I see any heads nodding? Then Joab came into the house of the king and said, Today, you have shamed all your servants who have saved your life today, and not just your lives, the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives, the lives of your concubines. You've shamed them by loving those who hate you and hating those who love you. For you have revealed today that the commanders and servants are nothing to you. For I know today that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then it would be okay as far as you are concerned. 
Oh, by the way, I found a new picture for Absalom. There it is right there. He continues, now therefore arise, go and speak kindly to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, no man will stay the night with you. And this will be worse for you than all the misfortune that has happened to you from your youth until now. So David does go out, speaks kindly to his servants. Anyway, David does another deal. Now Amasa, another one of David's nephews, joined Absalom and was Absalom's general. And David does a deal with this guy. He says, are you not my bone and my flesh? May God do so to me and more so if you will not be commander of the army for me continually in the place of Joab. Did you catch that? In the place of Joab. So how do you think Joab took that? Again, when they came at the large stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them because the deal had been done. Now, Joab was dressed in his military attire, and over it he had a belt with a sword and a sheath strapped on at his waist. And as he went forward, it fell out. And Joab said to Amasa, is it going well for you, my brother? And Joab took hold of Amasa by the beard, because really he's his cousin, with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa was not on guard for the sword, which was in Joab's hand. So he struck him in the belly with it and spilled out his intestines on the ground, and he died. Mm. His intestines went on the ground, Mom. Wonderful. There you go. Now, jo now Joab was again in command of the entire army of Israel. He doubled the size of the kingdom. So let's, uh, we've now gone through a profile of Joab's life. We're 25 minutes in and we're not getting done in 30, but we'll get done pretty soon. Let's review his life. Well, first of all, there's the situation where he murders Abner. Then he carries the letter. He receives the letter from David and murders the righteous Uriah. And by the way, a few other of David's men also get killed in the process but they don't even have names. Then against orders, he murders Absalom. He does confront David. And then last of all, holding by the beard as if he's going to kiss him, he stabs him in the belly. Now that part about holding him by the beard and going to kiss him at the point of betrayal, that really reminds you of somebody else in the Bible, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So what's the profile of this guy? Murder, 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 murder. And because he's grasping and he wants to be successful and he's not willing to, to give ground to anybody. Now you have a sense of somebody from 3,000 years ago, don't you? This is actually Psalm 37, got the, got the reference wrong. But this verse in the Psalm sort of characterizes this guy, Joab. I have seen a wicked, violent man. He's definitely a violent man, isn't he? Would you call him wicked? I have seen a wicked, violent man spreading himself like a luxuriant tree, prospering completely in his native soil. Doesn't seem right, does it? But I want you to know that his story is not over yet. There's another thing that gives you a real feeling for uh, what kind of guy this is. David is on his deathbed. He's picking Solomon to be his 
successor to be king. And he uh, gives his charge to Solomon. And the first specific thing he tells him to do is, you remember Joab, my nephew? Don't let his gray hair go down to shoal in peace. Make sure he dies and not of natural causes. Do not let his gray hair go down to hell in peace. This is David talking about his nephew. This is David talking about somebody who'd been with him all the way back since the cave of Adullam. You would think that if anybody would overlook Joab's faults and would care for him for old time's sake, it would be David. And yet, do not let his gray hair go down to hell in peace is the last thing he has to say about him. There it is again. That kind of characterizes him. Okay, one more little box on uh, David's family tree. Over here, Solomon is picked by David to be king. Before David formalizes it all, uh, his oldest son, Adonijah, thinks he's going to be king and gets all set to be king and convinces uh, Joab to support him. Well, Joab backed Adonijah before David put him on Solomon on the throne. David puts Solomon on the throne even before he dies. And then after David dies, Adonijah makes another bonehead move. You'll, I don't have time to go into the details. You can read about it. And as a result, Solomon says, that's it. This guy's a traitor. He will be put to death today. How's this going to affect Joab? Well, we went through all of the stuff. His story is not over yet. Here's what happens. Now the news came to Joab. What is Joab going to do? They just killed Adonijah. He knows he's on the wrong side. What does he do? So Joab fled to the tabernacle of the Lord and took hold of the altars, the horns of the altar. They told Solomon. Solomon sent word to Joab saying, why do you flee to the altar? Joab said, because I was afraid to face you. And I fled to the Lord. Then Solomon sent to Benaiah, who should have been one of Joab's best friends. He was like one of the other generals with David. Solomon sent to Benaiah saying, go kill and bury him. But maybe our politics aren't all that bad. So Benaiah went to Joab in the tabernacle of the Lord and said to him, the king says, come out. But Joab said, no, I am not coming out. I am going to die here. So Benaiah brought word back to the king saying, this is what Joab said. This is what he answered me. Then the king said to him, go and do as he said. Strike him down and bury him. And that's what happened. The death of Joab. Okay, so first of all, a little background here. What is this tabernacle of the Lord? You probably remember this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. They made this big movie about it. It was where the presence of God was consistently. And during King David's reign, they took it. It's a long story. It's worth reading. It ended up leaving the tent that they made for it when they left uh, Egypt and got taken over by the Philistines. But then David brought it back. And when he... Uh, took over Jerusalem with dancing. There's David, King David, right there with the harp, dancing. Brought the Ark of the Lord into Jerusalem and put it inside a tent. Okay, we're 32 minutes in. We'll be done probably by 45. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So there was an altar there too. This is the tent that Joab ran to. 
Now, it's worth saying a little something about this period of time. This is like a unique period of time in all of history. In all the other times in history, the Ark of the Covenant, with the presence of God himself, was either in the tabernacle, either in the tent that Moses made, or in the temple that Solomon made. And as you read in the book of Hebrews, it was not only in the tent, it was an inner tent. It was an inner tent where nobody could go in, only the high priest once a year. But during the time of David, the Ark of the Covenant was sitting in a tent where anybody could, and lots of people did, would go into the presence of God with the, with the Ark of the Covenant anytime they wanted. That's a picture of the New Testament, where when you... Be, when you put your faith in Christ, you can be unified with God and be in his presence without having to make blood sacrifices. So that's where this guy Joab went. He went straight to the actual, no kidding, presence of God and grabbed hold of the ark, grabbed hold of the horns of the altar. So let's just take this part a little bit. He said, I fled to the Lord. Now, you heard his whole profile, right? Does he seem like the guy who kind of guy who's a uh, big religious guy who's, uh, who's talking about uh, praying and being righteous and, and, and being very religious? I don't think so. Here he is late in life, and he flees to the Lord. What do you think the Lord is going to do when someone flees to him, when he's a murderer? We didn't even talk about the genocide of the Edomites, which Joab did. Read that, look that up in the fine print sometime. Well, here's what the Bible says. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is actually from the uh, prophet Joel quoted verbatim, and it shall be whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And why is that? Because in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance. Where did we receive our deliverance? We received our deliverance when Jesus died for our sins on the cross in Jerusalem. Okay, then what else did he do? He took hold of the horns of the altar. Now, the altar is where you place sacrifices, right? And what is the ultimate sacrifice? The ultimate sacrifice is Christ dying for us on the cross. Do you notice any parallels between someone else who turned to the Lord at the end of his life well, it's like the thief on the cross. This guy, Joab, is prefiguring the thief on the cross, running to the altar, fleeing to the Lord at the end of his life. Okay, now this is, uh, this is an interesting little thing, but the scripture doesn't say much about this thief on the cross, except for that he was a criminal. It says in one place, the other place it says, he was a robber. And yet, this is a really interesting thing about the Old Testament, which is that the Old Testament explains and clarifies the things in the New Testament, what their true meaning is. So in this case, by knowing what kind of person Joab was, who prefigures this uh, thief on the cross, you perhaps get a feeling for the kind of person the thief on the cross was. Now, John Chrysostom, about 200 years later, after the uh, crucifixion, maybe a little more, according to John, well, actually about 300 years later, according to John Chrysostom, the thief, he actually has an icon, he lived in the desert and he robbed or murdered anyone unlucky enough to cross his path. That's the best information we have on the backstory for the thief on the cross. According to Pope Gregory I, who's 
about the same time as John Chrysostom, a lot closer to the events than us, but still, two, three hundred years later, the thief on the cross was guilty of blood, even his brother's blood, killing his own brother. So isn't that interesting? This guy, Johan, fleeing to the altar, putting his trust in the Lord in the ultimate sacrifice. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus coming to him. And, and John, the Apostle John in 1 John said, He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. He himself is the sacrifice for our sins. Joab fled to the Lord and took hold of the horns of the altar. He was turning to the Lord and depending on the Lord's mercy the same way we do. But hang on a second. This guy's not just anybody. He's a bad guy. I mean, four murders and the guy who should be his best friend says, don't let him die in his bed. How can that be? And, and, and right at the end of the life, how is that fair? Well, as we already mentioned, everyone who turns to the Lord, everyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Because he's the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the whole world. In Hebrews, it says that Christ once for all time gave himself as a sacrifice. So his sins cover not just sort of bad people, but sort of good people, but they cover the sins of the whole world. You know, this brings to mind a couple of things that we do every week in the Divine Liturgy in our worship. The first one is before we, uh, before we sing the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Right before we sing that, we sing, In your kingdom, remember us, O Lord, when you come into your kingdom. What are we doing there when we sing, sing that? We're saying, I'm just like the thief on the cross. I'm just like the thief on the cross. I'm coming to you, Christ. It's not because of good deeds I've done. I'm coming to you like the thief at the end of my life. And then another thing we say right before we uh, receive communion. I heard it in the service tonight when I was listening. I believe, O oh Lord, and I confess that you are truly the Christ, the Son of the living God, who came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am first. This was a bit of a stumbling block for me when I first became Orthodox, because, you know, I haven't murdered four people like Joab, but it's really true. As far as I'm concerned, Christ came into the world to save sinners, and I am the first of anybody I know well, of anybody whose sins I know completely disqualify me to be a good person. I am the first. So it's really a wonderful thing that the thief on the cross, you know, he's the only person who's guar absolutely guaranteed by the words of Jesus himself to be in heaven. Because Jesus said, today, you will be with me in paradise. It's really good that people like Joab, at the end of their lives, can turn to the Lord and receive mercy. And the thief on the cross, without a chance to do anything to make up for the bad stuff they've done. Because that shows us that we're in the same boat and we can receive that same mercy. Well, what was the last thing that Joab said? He said, I'm going to die here. And this is really a challenge for us as well, right? 
we're all going to die if the Lord doesn't come back before then. Where do you want to die? What kind of person do you want to be? Where do you want to be when it comes your time to die? I mean, that's kind of the way I'm looking at this, uh, at this pandemic and going to church. It's like, if I'm going to die anywhere, I want to die here, holding on to the horns of the altar. And, you know, that fits into our Orthodox worship also, because in the litany that we say maybe two or three times during a service, we pray that we may complete the remaining time of our life in peace and repentance. Let us ask of the Lord, Lord, have mercy. That's the kind of person we want to be, right? Then there's one more thing we say all the time, multiple times in the service. Let us commend ourselves. The word commend means entrust. Let us entrust ourselves and each other and all our life to Christ our God. That's going into the temple, into the tabernacle, grabbing hold of the horns of the altar and saying, I'm going to die here. I'm entrusting myself to you, Christ. Well, so that's his story. Let's see what else I got here. But in a sense, his story is not over yet because this continues to happen throughout history and even to modern times. I'm going to tell a, a very quickly a couple of stories here of people I know personally. One of them is in this meeting. His name is Jim Reese. And his story was, he grew up in an every Sunday Catholic family. Every Sunday they were there doing what they were supposed to. But when he was in college studying physics, it just didn't seem to be true to him. He said, concluded, it's all about power and control embodied in perpetual guilt. I'm out of here. This is his actual words. He's in this meeting. I'm not making this up. But his story was not over yet. Decades later, he met a colleague, another physicist, who he respected, who could explain why Christianity actually best matches the facts of the world we live in, and got him reading some books from a group called Reasons to Believe, which gives good reasons for scientifically oriented people why they should believe that Jesus really is risen from the dead. And there, decades later, after living in a far country for decades, he became the Christianity was true. His wife had been praying for him. I got four or five stories. Then here's another friend. My father's friend, his actual name is Frank Perrin. He turned to the Lord late in life after decades of being prayed for. And here's how his story was summarized by his daughter-in-law. So Frank was always fearful of death. Later in life, he'd keep track of his blood pressure, etc. We had prayed for his salvation for years. And his grandchildren had always asked him, Pop, Pop, you need to have Jesus in your heart. And then he started having fainting spells. And his fear started amping up. Decades. But his story was not over yet. I'll never, he asked one day to speak to his son, John, and we all went over one night and prayed with him. And everything changed. He smiled more, went to church regularly and Bible study. I'll never forget when he was dying in Montgomery General. He was so peaceful and knew of his heavenly home waiting. Never say never. I wasn't certain he would come to the Lord. But he did, I think at 75 years of age. And actually, this applies to my own father. The guy was raised as a Unitarian, believed in some kind of creator out there, went to church to satisfy his wife, Christmas and Easter. And he became a Christian after my brother left him, a severe mercy. And my brother prayed with him, and his life was changed. Here's a really interesting story. This is one of my roommates from the, from the uh, single days. This guy was not a Christian. His brother was a Christian, was trying to 
get him to uh, start believing all the time. Anyway, they were out driving in the snow. He was driving and he lost control. His brother died and he was in a coma for weeks in the hospital. This is my roommate. I'm not making this up, but his story was not over yet. While in the coma, he had a vision of his brother in heaven and he puts his faith in Christ while he was in the coma and comes out of the coma as a Christian. Then here's a story I heard just like a week and a half ago. One of my best friends had a friend in high school. We called him Drew. He was the bass player in my first ever rock band starting in 11th grade. He was from a Greek Orthodox family, but he was a self-proclaimed atheist. I've been praying for him to become a Christian all these decades since about 1975. But his story was not over yet. What happened? His best friend, the last time I saw him, it was at a party and he looked unhealthy, kind of gray complexion with discolored teeth. His best friend was hosting that party. Three days ago, I got it. This is only like a couple of weeks ago. Three days ago, I got a text from Phil asking me to call him. I did. This guy, Andrew, from the Greek Orthodox family was in the hospital, clinging to life against several major health issues, including having, having uh, both of his legs amputated. No. Drew. Phil said oh, Drew had okay, prayed for him, and they had been praying over the phone together several days running. <laughs> it was terrible news and great news all in one go. So we have examples, Joab and people in our own lives, people I've mentioned, who are like the prodigal son. They took that journey to the far country. And, you know, at this point, we should probably pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know people that we really care about who are in a far country. We just pray you touch them and turn their hearts to have them turn to you. We pray you put them on our hearts so that we would keep praying for them, Lord, because their story is not over yet. Did anybody come to mind while we prayed? Who is that person? Look at this guy's case. I've been praying for him to become a Christian all these decades since 1975. You know what Jesus says about that kind of prayer? Here it is, Luke 18, 1. He was telling them a par parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not become discouraged. What does Jesus say about the people we care about who are living in a far country? I don't think I'm stretching this. He says we ought to pray and not become, we ought to always pray. We ought to pray and not become discouraged. Well, there we go, 51 minutes. Sorry I went over. You've now heard part three of the Lost Stories trilogy. His story was not over yet. Okay, well, I guess we got a little time for question and answer, but I think something that might be better than question and answer. If anybody has a story they'd like to tell about someone that they knew who had been prayed for and after years of being in that far country came to the Lord. Do we have anybody who'd like to uh, either ask a question or mention something like that? Okay, okay we'll see you then. Can you ask us to uh, put the gallery on? Yeah, let's put the, yeah, turn off. There we go. Now we can see. Can you turn off the recording? Thank I you. I finally turn off the recording. Yep. Stop.